Good morning and God bless you. I really appreciate every opportunity I have to, to speak, but more especially to meet with the brethren. And I know this isn't the best way to do it, but we'll do the best we can and ask God's blessing on it, and perhaps, perhaps some of you will benefit from it. I want to begin this morning with a, with a thought that has been on my mind now for a long time. And that is, I wonder if this is going to be my last sermon. It's going to happen sometime. And if it is, what should I say? Then again, I think about Gravelberg, I think about the, the times that I spent there, uh, the good times that I had driving out from Weyburn and sharing in your services. And I'm, I'm really blessed to have you ask me to do this. I preached my very first sermon in 1949. And you can do the, you can do the math. I was in Winnipeg. Then I preached regularly in Winnipeg from 1955 to 1960. In 1960, we moved to Weyburn, where I was, I believe, until 1982. And then I took over the responsibility of preaching for the church in Weyburn and concluded that in 1985. The reason I mention that is because it tells you just how much the church means to me. And I continue to hear from people that I've known years back, perhaps people whose marriages I performed or whose funerals uh, for their parents or their loved ones. My ministry includes a lot of things. Vacation Bible schools, summer camps, lectureships, Germany, Panama. And in every case, I, I can say this honestly and believing it, in every case, I was blessed by my church family. And I say this this morning to show you how much my life and the life of my family has been blessed by people like you. I couldn't help in preparing for today and having running through my mind David's comment in Psalm 37, when he said, I was young, but now I'm old, and I'm old. I want to give you just a, one brief anecdote of something that happened years and years ago uh, that has stuck in my mind because it means so much to me. We were on a fundraising trip for the college down in Texas, just north of Lubbock. And for some reason, I was invited to speak at that Sunday morning service. And, and I did. And afterwards, people were coming up and, and making the usual greetings and saying, you know, the various things. And a young fellow who I, I think was a college student came up to me and put his arms around my shoulder and he said, Mr. Weeb, or Brother Weeb, I'm not sure what he said, but he, he said, Mr. Weeb, when you got up, I thought, oh, this is just an old man going to speak. But he said, you got down in the seat right beside me. And that's what the church means to me. Get in the seat right down beside you. I miss 
having you out there where I, where I can see you, where I can feel your response. But anyway, I have decided that in the time allowed to us this morning, I'm going to just share with you some scriptures that I think are very relevant to today with what's going on in our world today, with the changes that are taking place in our society, and the struggle that many, many have, and I, I mean Christian people, have these struggles in dealing with the situation that we are in in this world. I want to begin by what I consider to be extremely relevant passage of Scripture from the Apostle Paul as he was nearing the end of his ministry, as he was awaiting what I believe was his death. And he wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4 these words. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me on that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Two little things come out of that expression of faith by Paul, and one is, I have finished my course. If you're familiar with the history of Paul throughout the book of Acts and what he writes in all the many epistles that he writes, Paul believed when God called him that he had a mission. And that mission was to go out as far as he could into the world and preach the gospel. And he did that. And nothing that happened to Paul, and many things did, nothing that happened to Paul deterred him from, mission, from the mission that God had called him to. You have a mission. I have a mission. And I hope and trust that you will complete your mission. You might say, well, what is it? Well, and I suggest you read Romans chapter 12. Take a look at that chapter once more. Make yourself thoroughly familiar with it. And just to abbreviate it, what, what God is saying is that I have made you who you are. And I have a purpose for you. And I want you to carry out that purpose. And when you look back on your life, as I look back on mine now, and ask the question, how well did I do what God wanted me to do? And may God help us as we approach the end of our lives to be able to say, I have finished my course. The second thing, of course, is faith. I have kept the faith. That's not easy. That's not easy. It never has been easy. When Paul wrote his epistles, almost all of them, maybe all of them, were written to the church under duress, to the church that was struggling, to Christians who were questioning their faith as I have questioned my faith, 
As I have said to God over and over and over again this past year, why? Why don't you step in and take care of this pandemic thing? But I have kept the faith. I am stronger today in my belief in our God than I have ever been. So I've kept the faith. What is faith? Hebrew says it's the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of things hoped for. We can't prove a lot of things, but we can believe a lot of things. And we need to build our lives on that faith. The second scripture that I want to share with you is one that you know very well. Everybody knows it very well. It's, it's a scripture that I think I read somewhere that said that this particular scripture is the most requested scripture by people who are suffering. And I remember being asked to read it to people who were in misery. The Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 23. I want to just place a little emphasis on that first line. The Lord is my shepherd. Let's read it this way. The Lord is my shepherd. Not any Lord, not anybody. The Lord, the one and only, there is one God and one mediator, the God or the Lord. How about reading it? The Lord is my shepherd. What a joy. The Lord, the master of all, is my shepherd. Not just any Lord, but my Lord. How about this way? The Lord is my shepherd. A statement of confidence, a statement of definite belief. The Lord is my shepherd. And then, to make it personal, the Lord is my shepherd. Okay, maybe yours, but the Lord is my shepherd. And finally, the Lord is my shepherd. He is my shepherd. He takes care of me. He looks after me. Now let me read it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Can you repeat that? With meaning, with purpose, with faith. I don't know how you feel this morning, but I do know that if you really, really are confident that the Lord is your shepherd, you'll feel better. You'll have a better day, and you'll have a better week.
Troublesome times are here, filling its heart with fear. And I come to what I think I've said in the past, and, and maybe it's true, is certainly one of my very favorite passages to go to when troublesome times are here. I've been there many times. Times when I lost my wife. Times when I had to give up my home. Times when the children were having problems. Times when I was told I couldn't have company. I couldn't get together. I can't go to see my family. Troublesome times are here. And I turn to Romans chapter 5. And I find, if not total comfort in the words, I find acknowledgement that it's okay. It's okay to acknowledge that you are concerned, that you have worries, that, that you bothered. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. <laughs> and I, I, I get a, a kind of a charge out of Paul's uh, writing this next statement. And not only so. <laughs> it's not just a matter of rejoicing and being happy and, and all of the things that go along with that. But not only so, but we glory, listen, we glory in tribulation also. Guilty. I'm guilty. I haven't been glorying all that much in this tribulation. I've been hoping and praying and asking God to 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 help us. And maybe God's been saying, come on, glory in tribulation. <laughs> maybe. Knowing that tribulation works patience. And patience, experience. And experience, hope. Experience, hope. This is not the first time the world has been in trouble. Read the Old Testament. Read the New Testament. Read the history of the church. Read the history of our country. Tribulation, tribulation, tribulation. But, and I've heard this on television over and over again, and I say, amen, amen. It can either kill you or make you stronger. And if you have faith, it will make you stronger. We glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation works patience, patience, experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which he has given to us. I 
I am not personally a prime example of this scripture at work. I know some people who are. And over my lifetime, I have been amazed by people who in various problems in their lives, difficult problems, have clung to God and come out on the other side stronger and more faithful. This is a true statement that Paul is making here. He's making it to the church in Rome, which was in trouble. And where he himself would face death. And finally, or not finally, but close to the end. <clears throat> One of my brother Wayne's favorite passages of scripture. It's one that we we really need to read over and over and over again. Philippians chapter four, beginning in verse four. Rejoice in the Lord when you are doing well. <laughs> Rejoice in the Lord when you're making money. Rejoice in the Lord when you're happy and healthy. Uh-uh. <laughs> I'm sorry, I misread that. Here's what it says. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, Rejoice, let your moderation be made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The Bible that I'm reading from today belonged to my mother-in-law. It was given to her on a special occasion by my father-in-law. And she has underlined verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. In our lifetime, there has probably never been a time when we need to be more positive. Positive in our dealings with other people, positive in working out those things which we have a talent to work at, and positive in our belief and our faith in Almighty God. Frankly, I think, I believe more strongly in God today than I ever have. Oh, I don't express it that often. But I'll tell you what, when I go to bed at night, I go to sleep. I don't worry about getting up in the morning. So what's the challenge for us? From each of these scriptures, I, I derive 
a particular challenge, and that is I need to be the best Christian that I can be. I need to reread Jesus' teaching on what it means to be a Christian, how to deal with people, how to accept adversity, how to trust God, how to live my life. Let me close by the last two verses that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity.